Friday of every month. Uh, we are extremely lucky to have uh, Mike Edwards today here to talk to us about uh, what is the role of conflict in uh, building high performance teams. Um, before I hand it off to Mike and introduce him properly, I just want to do a few announcements. So next Saturday, yeah. there is a coaching retreat. Um, I, I, used, I had the URL, but uh, there's some technology issue here. So <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you don't know how to find it, ask Shaheen because I have to live earlier. Yeah. <laughs> and this is Shaheen. He's also one of the organizers. Uh, also, we're organizing early Agile launch. Okay. So Mike will be talking at the coach retreat as well. So if you like what he's talking about, you can, you can learn more from him for the Agile coach retreat next week. And there are only a few tickets remaining for that. Wow, it's almost sold out. It's almost sold out, yeah. That's cool. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so we're doing a, a sort of a breakfast uh, meetup at Marche, close to Union. That will be on uh, April 12th, uh, 8 to 9.30. That will be just social gathering. Uh, you're more, uh, more than welcome to join there. Um, also, uh, Shaheen actually and I are also organizing an Agile Games event, June 15th. This will be a, a day full of uh, experimenting with all different games. So if you like games, if you want to learn more games or play with uh, others and teach others, that would be the right place to be. Uh, and yeah. And the discount code. Oh, yeah, yeah. And for this group, there's a special discount code. Uh, it's $30 only for a uh, full day of games. Code, obviously, is Agile Lunch. <laughs> and the URL is uh, agilegamescanada.com. Easy to remember, agilegamescanada.com. And now, uh, Mike, I, I've known Mike for six, seven years now. Uh, he's one of the most influential Agile coaches that they get the pleasure to uh, work actually with back and tell us and, and to know. Uh, he's been doing, he's been engaged in organizational change for the last 30 years. He's a faculty member of Agile Coaching Institute. Um, speaker across the world, he's been, he's, he's, good, he's very well known in all different kinds of conferences. So we're extremely lucky and fortunate to have him here. Mike, take it away. Thank you. What an introduction. Hopefully I can live up to that. <laughs> okay, so as I kind of get started here, I'm gonna pass these sheets around, take one of these, um, and if you don't have a pen or something to write with, pass these around as well, so that everybody has something. Wait, I should probably keep one of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So just in terms of who's here, Put up your hand if you're some kind of scrum master, team leader, technical lead, anything like that. Okay, quite a few. Uh, agile coach? Yeah. What's that? Aspiring. Aspiring, Aspiring yes. yeah. Probably, probably more so an agile coach than you give yourself credit for. Uh, any, any other kind of roles here? Product owner. Product owner, cool. Practice lead. Practice lead? Cool, excellent, okay. That just gives me some sense of who's here with us. So we're gonna start this off with a bit of a mingle. And there's a question right at the top of this page. Why is conflict important to a team? And so, hey, welcome, come on in. Grab one of these papers. There's a bunch of them floating around, grab a pen. And so what I want you to do is go introduce yourself to three people you don't know. And it works like this. I know Shaheen, so this is unfair. Hi, hi Shaheen, my name is Mike, and I think conflict is important to a team because, but only give a sentence. Don't, don't write a book, just give a sentence. And then move on to two more people. So go find three people, introduce yourself, and answer that question. Thank you. 
innovation, creativity, right? All of those things are kind of born in our ability to, to look at different perspectives. What else? Why is this important? It encourages discussion, uh, healthy discussion. Yeah, it encourages healthy discussion. It gets more, more of the ideas, more of the differences, more of the perspectives out there. Absolutely. Why else? Yeah, absolutely. We need all team members to feel heard. You know, Agile, we talk about it being real team-centric. It's about the team working together, right? Individuals and interactions, I've heard that somewhere, <laughs> right? And, and if we don't have conflict, you're going to have quiet people, right? Not all ideas are going to be heard. What else? A couple more. Yeah. Build a better product because you have the different perspectives coming in, and the reason there's conflict is because they have a different idea about how to get the best product. So if we all just agree, then we may not have earth, earth, um, different options. Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's something that in that that applies kind of universally, and for me is kind of my default answer. We avoid groupthink, right? Which from a product perspective is what you're pointing to. Absolutely. What else? One more. Oh, let's go somewhere different. Uh, Dimitar. Well, I would say builds empathy. Say more. Uh, well, when there's conflict and you, you can focus on uh, how people see from the other perspectives, sort of put yourself in different shoes Yes. and understand wh where they're coming from and uh, how to build trust with that this person. And yeah, very cool. Yeah. yeah. So conflict, we often look at the word conflict when we try to avoid it. Because let's face it, when we get into a discussion or a heated debate or whatever, it can feel pretty uncomfortable. But if we don't have it, you're going to have groups that <coughs> think, you're going to have a lack of product innovation or any kind of innovation, right? It's, it's going to be status quo. And, and so that's why this topic is so important to me, is because we want to start shifting how people think about what conflict means. Now, Patrick Lencioni, I'm going to run down to the other end for a second here. Hey, welcome. There's um, sheets on the yep. table there. Patrick Lencioni. Is that a whiteboard? Is that a whiteboard? No, only the middle. Oh, the middle. Oh, the middle. Yeah. Thank you for. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for. No, 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 no. You know, yeah, sorry, you have to open it. Open it. Yeah. Oh, Mike. 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 And I spent an hour drawing on a whiteboard, and somebody at the end went, is that a whiteboard marker? <laughs> 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 yeah. Patrick Lencioni talks about um, conflict as being on a scale. And at one end of the scale, he talks about conflict being very passive. We do not actively engage. And it was different opinions. It's a very passive kind of environment. Down at the end, other end, it's the uh, destructive, mean-spirited kind of conflict. <coughs> Obviously, we don't want to be here. There is also a line here where once we cross that, we start getting into the, the destructive, mean-spirited. That's the crossing the line problem. Where do you think the most, the optimal place for a team to be might be? If this is passive, that's destructive. Where would the most productive, innovative? In the sorry? Something in the middle? Yeah, absolutely. It's like right here. Right? We want our teams to be here. That's where the differing opinions are going to surface. And good teams will cross this line. We're human. It's going to happen. Good teams know how to recover from that. It starts with Wayne Luck, I'm sorry, Jeff. <laughs> right? Don't ever let it happen again. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Does that make sense? Cool, okay. So, so how do we do this? That's the question here. That's what we're here for, is to talk about how do we start moving our teams to the right on that spectrum and getting them into more of a healthier level of conflict being in the middle somewhere. So that's, that's what this is focused on. If they cross over that line and get into the destructive, mean-spirited stuff, that's conflict resolution. I'm not here to talk about that today. That would be another whole uh, challenge <laughs> type thing. Um, in terms of when you walk away from here, you're going to have a couple tools and things to think about, a couple book references, just gave one, Patrick Lencioni's work, right? There's going to be some of those things to go away with. Um, and, and in terms of how this is going to go, you'll notice there's no PowerPoint. I, I kind of do the interactive. <coughs> so expect more of this interaction throughout this next hour. Um, and I'm going to be done by 1 o'clock. If you got to go because you have a 1 o'clock, I won't be insulted.
Except you, if you leave, I'm just gonna be <laughs> Okay, so let's go into the first one. Who here has a good sense of uh, how comfortable you personally are with conflict? A couple people, okay. So in this first tool here, what I'd like you to do is think about yourself for a moment. And think about it from a comfort level. And so what you're going to do is in that space that's on the vertical, the vertical represents how deep do you like to go. So if you're a person that believes the best way to work through an issue is just to stay shallow, keep it nice, <coughs> um, talk around the issues, we don't want to say the thing that's going to hurt Wayne or Mike or whoever. So, you know, let's kind of, you know, and, and so you're really good at wordsmithing and staying shallow. That's, that's what the bottom of the step is. If you're a person that's like straight to the point, here it is, I, I, you know, I'm gonna put it on the table, it might make a mess, but I'll clean it up, right? That's what being up at this, the top of the spectrum is. So low is that shallower stuff, top is the deeper stuff. Do not look at it as good or bad. It's just who you are, right? Go to what you're most comfortable with. Give that a moment of thought, and then somewhere in that space on the vertical there, put an X. Now the horizontal axis here is frequency. So I want you to think to your typical days, kind of do an averaging kind of thing, okay? If you find you're getting into difficult discussions, we're using the word conflict, right? Not the destructive stuff. If you find that's happening many times a day, right? It seems like you know, every time you talk to someone else, we're getting into a good debate about something. That would be a high frequency. If you find, well, you know what, a couple times a week I might have that kind of conversation, that's a low frequency. So again, don't look at it as good or bad. Just think about your typical day. Put an X somewhere in that horizontal. <clears throat> now, if, for example, You put your X's something like that. All right, move this one over for now. If you put your X's something like that, kind of eyeball, where would those two intersect? You know, if it was down here, you're gonna look for what's the intersection. And then make a mark, right? Not a huge mark, because we're gonna have some words to put in. But wherever it is, put it there. Everybody good with that part? Okay. So let's talk here about what this is. So down the left side here, it talks about depth. So these top two things when it comes to depth means you have substantive. I could rewrite the word, but you probably don't want to watch me writing the same word twice substantive type of conversations. It means you want to get into the meat. You don't beat around the bush, you get straight into it quickly. Right, so these two top ones are substantive. These bottom two, the word to put there, is shallow. And again, it's not good or bad, it's just you tend not to go as deep, for whatever reason. Across the bottom here we have <coughs> frequency. Um, so this end is low, so we have infrequent and frequent. And then infrequent and frequent again. So if for example your X is in this top left, it means that you tend to have very substantive discussions, you get right into the meat of stuff, you're not afraid to dive deep, say what needs to be said, but you don't do it a whole lot, versus you do it a lot. 
right? Likewise, you tend to stay shallow and, and get into it less frequently versus frequently. This, this quadrant, is that making sense? So what do you think it would mean for somebody that might find himself up here with substantive and frequent discussions? What do you think their days are like? What do you think it might mean? Sorry? Constant battles. Constant battles, it could be. Stressful. Could be stressful. You might enjoy it. Yeah, yeah. It, it could be stressful. It could be also how they're wired, right? We probably all know somebody who's not afraid to just come in and, right? Well, stressful for other people then. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah. Just because they're comfortable being in the substantive frequent corner doesn't mean that the people over here are going to enjoy being with them. Yeah. What about people down here? What might it be like? I'm just going to go to the opposite here. People who are in the shallow and infrequent. They're, they're like Forget a, this. What's this like? They're like a sounding board. A sounding board? Yeah. Yeah, it could be. Right? They're that person that anybody can grab them and go for a coffee. <laughs> what else? I'd say lonely. <laughs> Same work. Could, could be not really introverted. Hang, hang on a sec. Sorry. Who was that? Yeah. Introvert. Introvert. Yeah, this could be your introvert. Yeah. 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 Sorry. That's exactly the Oh, great minds to collect. <laughs> <laughs> what else might this be like? They might be the ones trying to appease and calm things down. Mm hmm. Yeah. They could be the peacemakers in your team. But they might also be problem solvers. So mm -hmm. they, might, they might be where the problem comes, the solution comes out of because they are more problem identifiers and. and there is no direct, yeah, I'll come to you. Thank you. There's no direct relationship between this model and introvert, extrovert, extrovert but when you think about it, where is extroverts more likely to be? Top right. Oh, okay. Okay. Introverts down here, of course. Mm -hmm. Right? But there's no rule. I want to be clear about yeah, that. I would disagree with that. I, I think, like, on the bottom row, you're seeing sort of Problems. They could be very happy, chatty, talking to everybody. Possibly. Everybody, yeah. Yep. But they're not causing conflict. Yeah. They, they could. They could actually be avoiding conflict. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Whereas your introvert, maybe they don't talk to everybody, but when they've got a problem, they, they let you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I was going to add on to that point. They might be the ones that are just thinking through, you know, everything. So like sitting in the meetings, like listening. Mm -hmm. And then, as to his point, to be the problem solvers later on. Possibly. To, to that, whenever the, somebody speaks up and says that I, I, I disagree and this is why, if they still don't speak up or participate, then what do you call them? But that's different to whether they're conflict with others. So let me pause. This is great conversation. And, and you're actually hitting the point of this model. Is anybody looking at this and going, what on earth do I do with this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, you're wondering? Yeah, okay, we'll come back to that. <laughs> okay, let's go to the second one. The second one, the Thomas Kilman conflict model. Um, what, what the Thomas conflict um, model points to is the different kinds of conflict that exist. So I'm gonna move this a bit. <clears throat> What it points to is the different types of conflict. So across the bottom here, we have cooperativeness. And up the left side, we have assertiveness. If we have low assertiveness, so assertiveness being, you know, coming in and being assertive, cooperative being, being open-minded, being willing to work together, all that kind of stuff. What, when it comes to conflict, what might be in a low, low kind of category? Compl Sorry? Complying. Complying? Uh, Avoid. No. Avoid. Avoiding. Absolutely. <laughs> if we're in a low, low category, we avoid conflict. Is it bad to avoid conflict? Not always. Not always? Why not? Give me an example of where it would be good to avoid it. Someone with a gun. 
Someone with a gun, yes. There's no danger, absolutely. Well, it, it may not be big enough to worry about yet. It may not be it's big enough. I'm, I'm, I'm going to suggest may not be big enough is not the reason to avoid it because actually when it's not big enough, it's actually going to be a lot easier to resolve. Okay. Yeah. Conflict with the boss. Say more about that. Like superiors, right? Who have uh, authority over you. Workplace politics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same kind of, it's not physical danger, but there's some kind of perceived danger. Right. The other good place to avoid is when something's emotionally charged. Right. Mm -hmm. We need to calm down, right. so avoidance becomes a tactic mm -hmm. temporarily. Right. right? Let's just walk away and come back to it later. Mm -hmm. Make sense? So if we amp it up here, if we um, get more assertive, but we don't have cooperation, what might be going on? What kind of conflict? Aggression. Aggression? Yeah, yeah, yeah. A fight? So I make sure I get the right word in this too. <laughs> it's a competitiveness. Compete is the word they use in the model. In a compete kind of conflict situation, we have a win-lose scenario. Somebody will win and somebody will lose because we don't have the cooperation. When might this be good? Mm, when you're trying to win. When you're trying to win? When you're trying to say, win. Say a little more about that. Because my, my reaction was no, but, oh. <laughs> but, but say more, give me an example. Um. Maybe, I see your point. Yeah, there is a desire to win there. Yeah. When we move over to the top right there, that might fill that one in for okay. us. Um, but, but it's possible, you know, I'll grant that. Certainly when I'm negotiating with the bank to lower my lending rate, mm -hmm. I want to win. <laughs> <laughs> we had a tight deadline, a very hard technical problem. The two teams were spun up. They both were, had a deadline to win by building a solution that would work the best on the day of launch. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an unhealthy competition, it was so you're actually using competitiveness to create a better yeah. outcome. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, that's a good one. What? Sports. Sports? Sports, yep. Sports is definitely in this corner, right? If, if you're playing baseball, did the Jays win the other day? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it begins, <laughs> right? It's also the corner where we have emergencies. Production just went down. Uh, Dimitar just fell on the ground unconscious. <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Uh, this right? this, this is isn't like some, a medical thing or production going down. This is a <coughs> time to debate and you know figure out and everybody needs to be, we need production back up, mm -hmm. right? And so the people in the know are the ones that need to be in the winning side of it. Competing for resources. Competing for resources. I'm going to put that in the same category as that one. Just say, wait till we come here. Yeah. Yeah. It, it definitely feels like this. I, I would agree. Yeah. So I keep talking about this. So let's go here next. If we have high assertiveness and high cooperation, what do you think we might have? Collaboration. Collaboration. Absolutely. And this is the place of win-win. Right? This is so. In in you know, if we're um, negotiating for resources, people, right? We probably want to do it from here. It's often done from here. That that's going to be a better organizational outcome, right? Teams that are moving on that Patrick Lencioni scale close to that dotted line are moving up into here. We talk about collaboration, this is what it is. Lots of cooperation, lots of assertiveness happening. Make sense? What do you think this last one might be? Right, so we have low assertiveness 
and lots of cooperation. That's compliant when you are just saying, the, yeah, when you are. I'll, I'll use the word that's in the model, which okay. is to accommodate. Accommodate. Welcome. There is pages in the middle of the table here, and there's a bag of pens floating around if you need one too. In accommodate, what would be an example of accommodating? Why would I want to use accommodate? Not to get fired. Not to get fired, quite possibly. We're, we're back to some of that danger kind of stuff, absolutely. Maybe you don't care that much about the issue. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I'm kind of indifferent. You know, the thumb boat thing, it's the sideways. Whatever, I'll follow what, you know, the group says. Yep. Maybe you're in a new position or a new role. Yeah, new position, new role. Other people are the experts is really the key. It could also be a, a disagree but commit thing where, you know, in order to come to a decision, you don't agree with what's being decided, but you're not willing to go all in on opposing it. So Yeah, I'm willing to along. align, yeah. get on board, and accommodate what the group group walks. Yeah. So this last thing right in the center here is compromise. And it's one of the most commonly used forms of conflict in organizations. Unfortunately, compromise means we're in a lose-lose situation. Nobody wins. Right? So we don't actually want to be here. Typically, don't want to be here. What might be an example of where compromise might be okay? Warring between nations? Warring between nations? Yeah, actually in the working environment, you spot on. <laughs> Uh, except in the working environment, like I have uh, a manager or employee who are warring, literally. They're not firing missiles and whatever, but but they're they're fighting. It's an outright fight, and and so I'm doing some mediation work with them, and so the first place we go is to compromise. It's like a divorce situation too. It, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Actually, the form of coaching is is the same thing. Yeah, as you would use in, in couples coaching. But the, the starting place is to get them aligned and to compromise, so at least we can do the work that's needed to come to, then we're gonna move all the way around here somewhere, mm -hmm. right, in different ways. So that's the starting point then? Yes, in, in that circumstance, mm -hmm. the compromise allows us to, it, it brings, them up, brings them off that destructive end of that scale, right. um, so that we can then do the work that's needed. Mm -hmm. Hi, welcome. There's sheets in the middle here. Does this model make sense? Okay. So, two questions. Uh, and I, it might be addressed further on. Uh, yeah. One is um, the engagement. Yes. And the second is the um, criticality of the uh, conflict item. Uh, so, you know, is it, a, is it a small issue or is it like a really, you know, do or die issue? Yeah, the and, scale and, of it. Yeah, and, and sometimes people, for, for someone it might be a lot, like it's, it's a more subjective, but but if you look at it very objectively, uh, you know, a day off versus something, you know, like uh, something a lot more significant. Yeah, yeah. So so what's the question? So, 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 so would, how would those two items get funneled into these two models? Or, oh, or, or do they stay tuned for a moment. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for the segue. Okay. Yeah, that, that was helpful. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, so here's what to do with these things. These things are actually tools you can use with your team. Um, to start with, with this one here, what I do is I put a survey, an anonymous survey out to the team, and let's say there's 10 of us on the team. <coughs> everybody ranks everybody else on the team. So if there's 10 of us, I'm going to rank nine people. Everybody else is going to rank nine people. Um, and what I'm ranking them on is what's their um, uh, frequency? I had to make sure I got that the right way. What's their frequency? Do they rarely engage? Do they frequently engage? And what's the depth? Because as you know, when it comes to my personal behaviors, other people can see stuff better than I can. 
So we get everybody to do that, right? So all 10 people, and so we have this data set, and then what we do is a scatter diagram, you know, just in Excel with the bubbles that show frequency. I think it's called the scatter frequency chart, or so, I don't know, whatever exactly it's called. And so what we end up with is we end up with bubbles like this, and, and it's, you know, this might be Mike, this might be Dimitar, and so on. We end up with these. Then what I do is I take this information and I take it to the team. And everybody sees this and everybody gets this. And then we start talking about what's it like being in these corners. Do you see it? Do you see it in yourself? Right? But we talk about what's it like being in each one of these corners. And, and this is where you get out your coaching hat. Right? And you, just, you keep asking powerful questions. Shaheen, what's it like <coughs> being the guy way over here in the corner? Do you think this guy has frustrations? What would this person be frustrated about with these people? Not being able to get anything done. Not being able to get anything done? Not engaging. Not engaging. Not engaging. I mean, not what's going on? Like, what's going on with you? Yeah, like, why can't you just get to the point? Right? There might be a lot of small talk down here. Yeah where this guy just wants to get to it, right? So it becomes a tool to open the conversation with the team. How might it help your team's working agreement? Well, understanding the boundaries and the parameters of discussion, right? Mm -hmm. if, if everyone's at different places, coming up with some kind of a compromise or some, some common model mm -hmm. to say, okay, this is, this is our rule of engagement for this team. Absolutely. What makes it safe for this person to voice their opinion? What does this guy need from these people? Right? It gets <clears throat> that conversation going to say, what do we need from each other so we can shift the, the what what this is actually doing is building trust in the team. Awareness, definitely, but it's it's more about building trust. The wide open, vulnerable kind of trust. <clears throat> Right, so that's one thing. And by the way, with this one here, I haven't found like somebody's created a website where the tool's available. Um, I'll, I'll write my email address up here. If anybody wants my spreadsheet, I'm more than happy to give it to you. So you just run it through SurveyMonkey or Google Forms. So just a question. Do you actually show, when you show it to the team, people's names and what they're implying, or just the dot? No, nope. name okay, as well. So it's fully transparent. Fully yeah. transparent, absolutely. Yeah. So what do you do if someone what could you do with that? It's a great question. What could you do with that? You can start a conversation around it, but I mean, sometimes it can be. People can dig in their heels. Yeah. Yeah. Any thoughts? Well, I guess you could ask them where they would like to be, and then kind of work towards that. So, okay, you know, if you you're saying you're more engaged than you are then let's put you there and let's see how the team interacts with you at that level. Uh, but that's a problem because asking where would you like to be is having them say that this is actually where they are, they are. but if someone doesn't like their rating, they don't believe that they're over there. Yeah, like so they, they might see this as bad and they're going, I'm not there, mm -hmm. yeah, totally or, or whatever. <clears throat> what, what I actually do is ask them, where did you think you were? Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? And so maybe this Mike guy thinks he's actually here or here or wherever. And then we start to have a conversation, coaching, to, to help him, see, like the wisdom of the team, right? He is probably here, he just can't see it. So gently, with time, and it doesn't always happen in that meeting, sometimes it takes a little more time to help him see. What I find with a lot of these types of tools, I mean, they're just tools, all tools are wrong, some are helpful, right? Is it's freaky scary how accurate a lot of these are. And sometimes people just need a little space and time to see it for themselves. But it's also confrontational, I think. Maybe you should start with having personal conversations after you had the data. <clears throat> you could do that. I, I, I personally, you know, the way I approach it, is that you work it with the team, um, but I, I'm not gonna disagree with you. 
ex especially if I believed there was a really low level of trust in the team yeah. mm -hmm. or hostility, yeah. it, you're right, it might be a better place to start. Yeah, you use your common sense, you're gonna know the right way to approach that, but ultimately you wanna get the team in the conversation about that. So let me go here. Just one last question. <clears throat> so based on that, can you preface this, this survey with something to say, don't base it on a particular incident, base it on overall interaction? Oh yeah, do So totally. that if, if, you know, if somebody in one instance was a far right and another is a far left, you're not, uh, you're not kind of yeah, it's your typical, typical experience with these people is what you want. However, people will be biased by what just happened. It's, it's just a reality. <coughs> with this one here, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. Sorry, maybe you could ask the team to rate each other and also themselves separately. Mm -hmm. and then you also, you already have information about the distance between where the team faces them. So. Yeah, yeah, that could work too. In the survey, have them do themselves too right, yeah. and show it. Um, and, and, and as much as I agree with, could that happen? Yes, absolutely it could. Um, with the teams, I don't know, a couple dozen teams I've done this with, I've never once had anybody go, that's not me. Yeah. Most times it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Right, they do see it, they do see it. Well, but it's not to say what you're saying couldn't happen. The Thomas Kilman um, conflict model, there are, if you Google it, you'll find even free assessments where you can get your rating, right? It'll tell you where your natural tendencies are. How do you think talking about conflict in this way could help your team? Uh, they, they agree on which part of this model they are at. Like with, for this situation, do we need to collaborate? Do we need to avoid this situation? What's, what's the... That's it right there, exactly. And it's not a universal, we will always do mm -hmm. this, because everybody wants to be here, right? We all talk mm -hmm. about it. We all want to be in this collaboration thing. But collaboration isn't always applicable, right? And so it gives the team the language to talk about how they're approaching conflict, right? How do we shift that into that bubble in the middle of the um, Lencioni scale there? Okay. Makes sense? So this is just a discussion? <laughs> yeah, this is a discussion. You could use this tool to say, um, if they're having a lot of conflict, to, to have a discussion about what is the conflict we're having but typically it's, for me, the way I've used it is to give them the language to talk about what's needed. Because when production goes down, just picking something, we, we need a backup, right? This isn't the time to figure out how we're all gonna win and be happy, and we'll talk about that afterwards. But if this is where they're going, it gives you the language to say, is this the most appropriate way for us to handle this? Right? And to bring him back, no, wait a minute, you're right. right. Shaheen has all the answers. He knows it best, so Shaheen, tell us what to do. But that's also a win-win, I have to say. And, if, if we know that someone has the answers, we should go to him, that's collaboration, the way I see it. I think you should always be. No, but if I have a differing opinion, but he's the expert, <laughs> if you are, that's if a win-lose. That he's the expert. Yeah. There's a the, crisis now. This would look like debating what's the right way to get production back up. Yeah. If you're talking about what's the right way to build a new feature and we have a disagreement, I totally agree. Right? Because there might be a more innovative way. But if it's an emergency kind of situation, it's not the time. If somebody if somebody has the answer. I'm just not to me the way you're with your production example, the collaboration, because you need all hands on deck, you want everyone to, you know, whether it's going to be technology or risk or whatever perspective, just doing what, what needs to get done to get you out of this pickle. Uh, they're not really competing as such because they're just providing their expertise to get the problem fixed at that point. It, it could be, or it could be. Okay. You know, 
I'll give you my favorite consultant answer. Okay. It depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm taking it to extremes for illustration. Okay. You're right. There could be times this makes more sense. Right. But it's, but it's not the time to find the most innovative right solution. It's time to get production back up. Right. So if you can do that here, that's yeah. cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Mike, uh, what's the soonest that you introduce that model to a team? Usually fairly quickly. Like, not 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 day one kind of thing, right, right. but within a couple of weeks. Couple, okay. Even yeah. if the team is new. Oh, totally. They, yeah, okay. Yeah, because they're gonna have their own natural. Oh, sorry. Let me back up. Um, I'm making the assumption the team's been working together and are aware of each other. Because okay. how do you rate somebody if you haven't worked with them? Right. Right. So exactly. that you, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. So if the team just formed, just came together, they're not going to be able to do this. This might be something I wait a month or two. So when they get into storming, right, that would be a good time to pull out this thing. You have more basically your understanding of what stands kicking. Yes. With, you know, in situations when whatever situation we happen to be, it, it kind of gives a guideline of which stands to take at what appropriate time. So that's, that's what. I'm wondering how does that relate to the Kinevan model that there's a chaos, then you probably Go into that. That is production example that you use. So use that as a you know going to one of these. Yes, I think yeah. it's any resemblance is coincidental. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't I hadn't thought of that, but um, I don't see. Yeah, I'm not seeing a relationship. No. Maybe if we we thought about it enough, we could. Uh, yeah. About it. Yeah. So let's flip the page here. I want to be sensitive to the fact we have a few minutes left here. So when it comes to, and I'm not going through all of this, this is really the takeaway here. When it comes to how do we create the support for healthy conflict on teams? Couple tools, right, that we can use to introduce the language to talk about, to become more self-aware and aware of others, help form a working agreement. This top thing here, Supporting healthy conflict in a team. You know, if a team has aligned goals, it's going to be much easier. <coughs> Recognizing and acknowledging um, people who engage in healthy conflict. What might it look like to recognize and acknowledge people for that? To let the team know it's okay. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That was a delay tactic, by the way. <laughs> a tickle happening. We you could do like a, a team shout out at the maybe at your retrospective and say, "Hey, I, I really appreciated when Shaheen challenged me on that, and I think we got a better better product out of it because of that." Yeah, that they're appreciating each other. Yeah. It could also come from the whatever leader, scrum master, coach, whatever to say, hey, look, Wayne and Shaheen, I know that was a really tough conversation. I just want to acknowledge that you worked your way through it. Yeah. Right, that kind of thing, whatever the right words are there. Right, examine your own actions. I'm not gonna go through all of these here, but examine your own actions. If your team is engaging in conflict, there is a good chance something about how you're behaving is causing it. If you're always up here, yeah. That could drive conflict low. If you're always down here, they could follow you there. I mean, I mean, any kind of scenario is possible here, but a really good way as a leader to look at why isn't the team engaging in conflict is to look here. Yeah. Same with where do I normally go? Yeah. If, if I'm always going here, I'm looking for you to lose, right? And so that'll drive conflict away. Right, so look at your own actions. So you, you can keep reading through those. And by the way, I'm in no hurry to leave, so if somebody wants to talk about some of this more, I'm more than happy to stay. The bottom ones there, give credit here. If you haven't read it, uh, Brene's Dear to Lead book, right, her latest book, excellent book, and I, I love Brene, I'm a big Brene fan. Um, and a lot of her books are really good, but it's like, okay, so how do I apply this? Great, let's have vulnerable trust. This one has the stuff on how to apply it. The list down here, and I didn't give credit, I realized that after I printed it. It's, it's in this book, okay? I'll leave it right here if somebody wants to take a picture or whatever of it. 
right? And, and she talks about it as rumbling, that we get, as a team can rumble, means we can come together and have a crucial conversation. And, and she talks about what she calls rumble starters here, or, you know, things like the story I make up about this, right? I'm looking to get underneath what's being assumed here. Uh, I'm curious about, tell me more. That's not my experience, which is very different than saying, you're wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. right? But, but when I say, that's not quite my experience, now we can get into a conversation about it. So, highly recommended if you haven't read it yet. You're smiling and nodding. Do you agree? No, I, I just have it. I'm listening to the Ah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, actually, I've listened to it twice now. So, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Excellent. Well, we are at 1 o'clock, yeah. so I just want to thank you. A couple of tools. Go out and have conflict and have fun with it. <laughs> Thanks, thank everyone. Thank Uh, again, thank you, Mike, for coming here. My pleasure. And uh, again, thank you guys for joining us, and thanks, Mackenzie, for hosting us. Thank you, thank you a lot. Um, the, next, the next one, uh, the Agile lunch having will be a very early Agile lunch. As Dimitar said, it will be a social at Marche. If you want to come and network with other people, we are going to announce it very short. Thank you, guys. And if you want my tool, it's Mike at leadingforchange.ca. Send me a note, more than happy to get to my spreadsheet. <clears throat>